Well, an obvious thing that you can ask yourself is what comes after ResNet, right? And that's ResNext. I think we briefly covered that uh, last time, but it was a little bit brief, so I'm just going to review that in a bit more detail. Um, so remember in ResNet, you essentially have this stack of one by ones and three by threes. And effectively what happens is that if I have one layer here, another layer there, then within a single pixel, right, so you have this entire stack of, you know, channels. You want to turn that into another stack of channels. Okay. Now, if you do that, then this requires basically a CI times CO operation, which is expensive. And the dimensionality that you can afford is basically proportional to CO. And yeah, obviously also CI, but really um, you now, so, so you have two knobs that you might want to control separately, namely the number of parameters, which depends on this, and the number of output dimensions, which only depends on that. And so ResNext is a very clever way of separating the dependency between those two. So what you do is, effectively, if this is my matrix, you know, CI times CO, rather than taking the full matrix, you're basically approximating it by a block diagonal matrix, where now within each block, things are dense, but the rest is all zeros. If you do that, you can afford a larger matrix, right? You can make it larger like so, by having another two blocks maybe. And the number of parameters alternatively is reduced. So if you look at it again, basically by breaking up the convolutions into individual subchannels, you get, you know, more memory efficient tools. And if you then go through the detailed calculation, so that's what they did in the ResNext paper. And they used a design that is very, very similar to a ResNet. Well, which isn't such a big surprise because Kaming here is one of the authors on both papers. Um, he basic, they basically engineered ResNext to have essentially identical number of parameters and number of flops, but just have more channels, but at the same time have no larger number of parameters or flops. Yes? Um, what's the difference between doing this and say having just like one convolution that has a large output channel, but the convolution matrix is sparse? Okay. So sparse convolution matrices. Yeah, so effectively, this is a special sparse matrix, right? If you, if you think about it, what, what the question was is, well, okay, Alex just wrote down a really weird block diagonal sparse matrix. Why can't we have a general sparse matrix? And as a matter of fact, you could do that. The problem is that GPUs are really awful when it comes to sparse matrices, right? Part of the reason is that, well, GPUs don't like pointer lookups. So if the matrix is not too sparse, then you're better off actually just using zeros for the rest. So you might, you know, go and, you know, have only 10% non-zeros and you're still faster off using, uh, writing it out as a den dense matrix. And where that trade-off occurs, whether it's at 1% or 10% or 30%, that really depends on the GPU or the CPU on which you're executing things. So in other words, you're not going to get any speed up by going sparse unless you're extremely sparse. And the other thing is it's a lot harder to control the result of that. So it's m you're much, much better off having a predefined sparsity for which you can then optimize on your GPU. Now, there's no reason why you couldn't have another few blocks in here, right? 
maybe something like that's block sparse. Um, there would actually be an interesting research project to maybe add, you know, another set of you know block sparse interconnections here. Um, there are. As a matter of fact, I'm going to show you a strategy that's very similar to that in the next few slides. So that's ShuffleNet. But it's a good question. Yes? It's basically saying it's better to make it sparse in like a controlled way so you can break it up. Exactly. So if I know where my sparsity is and if the sparsity is predictable in such a way that I don't need a secondary index structure to store the sparse index, then I can do this efficiently on my GPU. Whereas if I need to always encounter some surprise by doing that sparse lookup, then my GPU is going to be slow. So let's look at the zoo of more ideas. And this is really just going to give you, you know, the tip of the iceberg. So one idea is, well, after all, ResNet worked. So why not go? even further, right? So if, if you think about it, you know, ResNet went from parameterizing, you know, f of x equals 0 to f of x equals x as the simple function. But you can essentially get like a higher order Taylor series type expansion. So what you do is basically you define xi plus 1 to be the concatenation of xi and fi of xi. So as a result, that vector will keep on growing, and it'll basically have increasingly higher order terms in its expansion. So you start with x1 is x, x2 is you know, x and f1 of x, um, x3, um, so typo here, is x, f1 of x, f2 of x, and f1 of x. And I got bored after that because the expansions just get a lot longer, right? Basically, x3, x4 would be, you know, this term plus f of all of that term, right? So it just gets tedious. Um, now, this is what DenseNet did, and at the time, it looked like this was the right way to go. Actually, quite surprisingly, um, if you train ResNet really well or ResNext really well, it outperforms DenseNet. So how did they manage to do really well? And I think they got the best paper price for it for DenseNet. Well, their training implementation was better. So sometimes it's not the network, but how you train it that lets you win benchmarks. Um, this is the thing that isn't always clear to people when they read papers, right? Because I mean, how would you know, right? Sometimes the description of training is quite vague. Sometimes the only way to get to the bottom of it is to actually look at the code. Okay, so DenseNet is kind of useful, but not that much. Here's one that's actually a little bit more exciting. Um, it's called Squeeze ExciteNet, or SCNet. And this uses something that we will cover in a bit more detail later on, namely something called attention. So attention is essentially a mechanism where rather than taking averages over a bunch of vectors, we're using a separate function to gate how that average should be computed. And I'll just leave it at that for now. We'll get into that in a lot more detail later on when we cover attention in a lot more detail. But what Squeeze ExciteNet does is, if you think about the various channels, maybe there's a cat channel and there's a dog channel and maybe there's a I don't know, dinosaur channel, right? Now, if you knew that you're recognizing a cat, well, what would you do? You would overweight that cat channel and you'd downweight the rest, right? But that's kind of stupid, right? Because, I mean, how would I know that I'm recognizing a cat until I've actually recognized the cat? It's like, once I know the answer, well, you know, the question becomes a lot easier. Um, the other thing is that the information transfer that I have in convolutional networks is kind of slowish, right? So if you think about it, right, we have maybe a 3x3 three three convolution, another 3x3, three three, then we pull and so on. So it can take like four, five, six layers until the information from this corner percolates to that corner. And that's awful, right? Because maybe 
if there's, you know, a bowl of milk here, I know that, well, the chances that there's a cat over there is much higher, right? So I would know that from the context. So my cat detector can use the fact that there's a bowl of milk to infer that, well, there's a cat. So what are we supposed to do? Well, what you could actually do is you could take very simple inner products of the entire image, you know, on a per channel basis with some other vector. And so now you get some numbers, you know, you get channel many numbers out of it. So this is a very simple object. It's fairly cheap to do compared to all the convolutions and everything. And now you use those numbers in a softmax over them to reweight your channels. So therefore, if this very cheap procedure tells me, well, there's a good chance that there's a cat somewhere, I can now upweight the cat channel. Okay. I, I, I bet there is no cat channel, but if there was one, it would do that. Um, suffice it to say, SENets actually improve the accuracy. So they're currently actually the best ones in the model zoo. Yes? So this weighting function, is it the same across layers? No, I have one weighting function per layer. And so this basically gets computed in parallel to the convolution. And then the results from both paths are merged, right? And you're basically performing a pixel-wise vector multiplication of you know, that weighting vector that's written in nice pretty colors with the original tensor. because I have weighting that is global over all the pixels in a, in, in a channel, right? So it's global in that sense. And that allows me to send information about what's going on in the world very quickly to other parts of the image. So this weighting function, um, what kind of form does it take? Is it also a convolution? So, okay, so the weighting function, um, okay, let me quickly write that out. So let's say I have x, and that's maybe in our, you know, channels. I'm going to drop the batch right now times maybe height times width, right? And so now I go and multiply this by some weighting matrix. And that weighting matrix is also going to be in R C times height times width. And I put and I get the following result Y is sum over height and width of X H W C well C H W times W C H W Y C. So these are now you know, so basically YC, that's of course in RC. And then I go and perform update, YC becomes softmax of YC, of, well, Y becomes softmax of Y. Right. And now in the end, I can go and use that to reweight every element in X. So every element in X then go becomes X C H W goes into Y C X C H W. Yep. So this W is like a convolution that's the size kernel size of the entire image and one channel, one output channel. Um, it would be. I, not quite, because you actually get one result per output channel, per channel. Right, right. I mean right. the result of x times w is like a... Um, not quite, right? Because you have one output per channel. If it were a convolution, then you would only have one y, okay. which would entirely defeat the purpose, because then you'd have a single number by which you reweight the entire activations. So now, again, you have not made any preference between any of the channels. So it's, it doesn't fit quite into um, 
into convolution, it fits much more closely into just an inner product. Right. It's basically a tensor reduction. Yes? Ws are also learnable Yes, so Ws are all learned. And it's a fairly small number of parameters in addition to everything else. So the overall cost is reasonably benign. Makes training a bit more expensive, but the cost is overall reasonably benign. And then you get high accuracies. Okay. Now, here's the last thing. And this was in the direction of, well, can we do something a little bit more structured or you know, more, more sparse? structured with our networks, right? So if you think about ResNext, ResNext breaks up the channels into, you know, subgroups, and then, you know, each within each of subgroup of the channels, you do your stuff, and then, you know, in the end you combine, right? Um, now, that's not necessarily very good because you may end up getting those very long stovepipes, essentially, where the features only mix within each of those but not across them. I mean, after all, you, you got rid of the you know, cross-channel mixing in order to get you know, faster computation and everything. Now, one way to bring it back is you just go and reshuffle things in between convolutions. And so in this case, if we have three channels, well, I go and basically pick you know, one from the red, greens, and blues, and you know, turn that into a new block, and then I essentially intertwine things in a meaningful way. That gives you a little bit more accuracy. So shuffle net is what you get out of that. And so they apply the shuffle operation to ResNet and to ResNext and to SENet. And yeah, it, it helps. Yes? I'm confused. Are they just shuffling the order of the channels? Yeah, they basically, what you would have gotten before in ResNet if we look at that, right? So you would basically have had, you know, those four networks operating in parallel. What they do is basically between every convolution, they mix up the features between the various networks. So they essentially add another permutation matrix in it, and so with that it only has, you know, unit weights, so there's nothing to learn. Yes? It doesn't learn how to shuffle, no. Um, that's an interesting question. Um, maybe somebody can figure out a way how to do that. Um, my hunch would be that going from permutations to something where you have maybe two copies or three copies, but, but overall, you know, log number of channels copies might potentially help, but I don't know whether it would really make any difference relative to other architectures. So the, given that the number of, you know, channels isn't that large. I mean, it might be 32. There isn't that much that you can gain. Yes? Why is it very efficient? Or Why is it very efficient? Well, um, so on a, mobile net, on a mobile phone, I mean, you don't want to have a lot of computations. And ResNext is one of those cases where you can get high accuracy for a small number of, com comparatively small number of computations. And ResNext gives you even higher accuracy for that. So now you have this trade-off, accuracy versus speed. And you can either try to win the benchmark by having a network that's humongous and highly accurate. And mind you, there's a, essentially a shuffle net paper that aims for high accuracy. The title is a little bit different, but it's basically same authors, very similar network architecture, but high accuracy. Or you can go on this Pareto curve of accuracy versus speed, and you push for speed. And shuffle net tends to be a little bit faster than, for instance, mobile net. So there are a number of other tricks that you can do, but that's pretty much the bag of tricks that kind of work in the context of computer vision. Probably next year by this time, there'll be, there will be like three, four more slides of things that work. And yeah, so one last thing would be you know, separable convolutions, if you will. So that's in uh, mobile net. That's actually a precursor of ResNext. So ResNext uh, you know, has groups of channels. Separable convolutions basically treat each channel separate, separately, right? 
So if I have 20 channels, then you know I can get 20 separate convolutions. Whereas in a rest next, maybe I break up those 20 channels into five groups of four each. In a shuffle net, I would do the latter and then shuffle between them. Okay. This is about it for you know what covers the more interesting parts of the model zoo. So to summarize a little bit, we talked about inception and ResNets. And the key point in inception was essentially that you can mix and match different types of convolutions and you can use batch norms. ResNet used this idea of a tail expansion. ResNext decomposes convolutions, so it's basically separable convolutions but with a bit more control. And then there's this entire zoo of additional things that you can do. And probably SENet and ShuffleNet are the more interesting parts there. And that's it for the model zoo. Now, any questions so far on the theory? Okay.